OK, well, welcome uh, to this afternoon, sir. Uh, it's still this morning, right? Yeah. Um, it's gorgeous weather out here. I don't know why this room is nearly as full as it is. I would certainly not be here if I did not have a contractual obligation with probation officers to be here. It's part of that work release program, OK? It's, we finally got some gorgeous weather here in San Diego. I hope you guys are able to enjoy it. Um, OK, this is, uh, uh, the title of this is Big Data and Analytics with ArcGIS. Uh, my name is Eric Hole. I'm the, uh, I'm the dev lead on the geodatabase team. And with me up here is Mike Park. Mike Park is one of the dev leads on the big data team. Um, what's interesting is uh, we've been working, the geodatabase team and the geoprocessing team have been working very closely together in this problem space for quite a while now. And so it's, uh, this is sort of a joint project type thing. We have also have uh, some other team members in here. We have uh, Mark Janicus, who's a uh, who's a senior developer working on the analytic capabilities for big data. We also have Sarah Osborne, who's our main prime, uh, product engineer. We have Dev Oliver, who's a guy who's been on the team for about two weeks now. He's in charge of everything else, I guess. Um, okay, so here's the first slide. We we really didn't like this slide. This is the slide we put forward to corporate. We want something that really focused on big data, and that is a big data. It's a planetary big data. We got shot down. Do not tell anyone we gave this slide. We need the plausible deniability, okay? But that is big data. Now, this is, uh, here's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about, very briefly, Hadoop and MapReduce. We're going to talk very briefly about the GIS tools for Hadoop that we released up on GitHub, open source code. And then we're going to spend most of our time talking about moving forward, where we are heading. We're going to be showing, giving a lot of user stories as well as demoing software. These are real R&D prototypes back in Redlands. Now, this is interesting. I've never given a session at the UC, a tech workshop, since God first started in 99, where we've been talking so much about the future and showing prototypes at this level. This is a rapidly evolving problem space. There's a lot of interesting things going on, and we want to give you an indication of where we are going. This is not technology that's going to be released as part of the next uh, ArcGIS release, 10.3, later this year. These are more forward-looking things, okay? But we want you to see where our mind is, what we're expecting, what we think the user community would like. And we'd like your feedback, quite honestly, okay? So let's get through it. What is Hadoop? Hadoop. Everyone talks about Hadoop. It's just an open source framework as part of Apache that allows you to do distributed processing on huge quantities of data using commodity hardware truly commodity hardware. It's part of Apache. Um, the interesting thing here about Hadoop is that it assumes that you have a lot of hardware failures. You know, this is very different from, say, you rewind 20 years ago and we look at parallel processing and we all had these, if you were lucky, you had access to some very exotic $10 million machines to do your parallel processing algorithms on. And there, if there was a failure, bad things were happening. The interesting thing here is it assumes that you have hardware failures because when you're using commodity hardware, that makes perfect sense. Now, Hadoop is used for two primary things. First, distributed storage, as well as distributed computation. Now, where did this come from? Where did Hadoop come from? Let's go to our Wayback Machine, back to the mid-90s. Let's go to Berkeley. Go Bears. Berkeley had this project called the Network of Workstations, which way, their idea was, we're going to take a bunch of just garden variety PCs, and we're going to assemble them into a distributed network, and we're going to create an infrastructure that will allow us to do parallel distributed processing on them. That was the NOW project, and this is actually a screen grab of their website I took this morning. The website has not changed since 1998. It's a classic look back into old school web, okay? So search for the Berkeley NOW project. Then, Google. These guys weren't so dumb. 
they went and they took these ideas that they saw at the NOW project. These guys were from Stanford, Sergey Brin, and the other guy, I can't remember his name. Um, they went and took this, works, this research that was going on up the road in Berkeley, they were in Palo Alto, and they started Google. Now, the interesting thing was, in 2003, they published a paper, and this is the top part of it, called the Google File System, GFS, by Sanjay Howard and Shun Tak. Um, and in it, they described this file system that you could run against a distributed cluster of commodity hardware, okay? That's what Google had been doing internally. They published a paper, very interesting. They started publishing more papers in that time frame, 2003. Then, Doug Cutting and some other people at Yahoo in 2005 said, hey, this is pretty cool. I wanna try implementing a piece of that. So they started an open source implementation of, of, uh, uh, of the GFS, Google File System, and they called it the Hadoop File System, HDFS. Similar concepts, similar architecture, but an open source implementation that was then part, became part of Apache. So that's where Hadoop came from, okay? The whole idea is in the mid 90s, or late 90s of having commodity hardware and being able to do great things with them rather than $10 million machines. And Google took that, pushed it way far forward, and then Yahoo had the idea, some guys at Yahoo, let's, let's make an open source implementation. Now, other key thing, MapReduce. We're gonna just talk about a couple of key terms. That's the programming model that you use when you're running on Hadoop, if you are actually writing source code. Uh, you have a map, uh, a map uh, you have mappers and you have reducers. The MapReduce system, it's actually a programming model. It's not, it's not bound to Hadoop. It's not bound to GFS or anything like that. You can find MapReduce, it's a style of programming, okay? It's just a way. Let's go through an example, actually. But because it is just a style or a method, a model for programming, there have been many MapReduce uh, libraries that have been created with all kinds of different language bindings, and they're all not tied to, uh, tied to Hadoop, okay? Now, let's go through a little example very quickly. Let's say we want to do word counting. And let's say we have a library. We have the entire digitized library, the Library of Congress. And it's all just in a bunch of text files. Each book is another big text file, okay? And let's assume, without loss of generality, that all the words in the universe consist, consist of red, green, or blue. Those are the three words in all the books in the Library of Congress. Here's our input text file, okay? Now, how this works, is when you start up a MapReduce job, you'll point it at your input, and you'll provide it with some arguments. Then you have a splitter that's going to read those, all those big text files, and it's gonna create one record for each line and assign it to a different processing element. So the first line, red, red, goes to maybe the first processing element. Green goes maybe to the second. Blue, red, maybe still goes back to the first. It's not, it's not real important where it goes, but we're seeing that we take this big input file, and we tear it apart line by line and assign it, or split it, and assign it to different processing elements. Then we have a mapping function, essentially mapping tasks, where they're gonna take each line, and they're gonna turn it into, they're gonna emit a record, essentially a key value pair, for each line and each word that it recognizes. So. The first math task reads the first line, it's red, red. It writes to its output essentially red, gives it a value of one, red gives it a value of one. It's gonna do it very simply. Every time we see a word, we're gonna emit that word and we're giving it a value of one, okay? So that's the output of the mapping task. Then, MapReduce, the infrastructure goes and it sorts, shuffles and sorts the data around. It organizes it according to the key values. So it goes and coalesces all the things that were green together, all the things that were red together, and all the things that are blue together. And then it's going to provide it to another reduced task. And in this example, we have two reduced tasks. The first reduced task is gonna take all that input, all those key value pairs, and it's gonna sum them. And so for the key value, uh, for the key of green, it counts four of them. For the key of red, it counts four of them. The second reducer, 
only sees a key value or key of blue, but it counts five of them. So it writes as an output, a partial result of blue five. The first reducer writes as a partial result, green four, red four. Then finally, an output writer coalesces all those partial results from the reduced tasks and produces your result output. We had four green words, four red words, five blue words. Okay? That's a very simple example of how MapReduce works. It's a programming model. It's not a language, it's not a particular piece of software, it's a model. Okay, Hive. Hive is, when we were talking, or talking earlier, this is another important part of the Hadoop uh, infrastructure that you need to pay attention to, the ecosystem. First, one thing we should mention is HDFS, or the Hadoop Distributed File System. That's just a file system that works across this collection of all these computational elements that you have in your cluster. It's just a hierarchical file system. And it's just storing things much like a regular file system would do. But the interesting thing here is there is data replication. So for example, this if we had a bunch of earthquake data in the 2011 earthquake data that's stored in a CSV file, comma separated value file, it might replicate that to three different nodes inside your cluster or more. You can determine, you can control that. And this is why the system is more fault tolerant or one of the reasons why it is more fault tolerant because you've distributed the data. If one node goes down in your cluster, so what? The data has been replicated in other locations, okay? So, the nice thing about Hive, back to Hive, is it allows you to treat a CSV file or a JSON file or some other file, it's just some text file, who knows what, and you can essentially map it to a table metaphor where you can say, treat this thing like a table with rows and columns. And then after you've mapped it to a table metaphor, you can then say, oh, once I have that, I'd like to have a SQL-like language to manipulate the thing with, okay? So you can do SQL-like queries against this data using Hive that's stored on HDFS under Hadoop, okay? So here, we have our CSV file. If we pop it open, maybe the first two rows look like this. Just standard CSV file. Then, when we map it into Hive, we can say, oh, that first, uh, the first thing maps to a date time, the second uh, grouping corresponds to latitude, third longitude, then depth, then maybe magnitude of the earthquake, okay? Then, once I have this table metaphor, I can execute a query, a Hive query, where here what we're trying to do is select all the records in this earthquake table where the magnitude is greater than seven. Okay, that's the Hive query against the Hive table that's running against a CSV file stored in HDFS. Now, important thing to note, when you map an, a CSV file or a JSON file or whatever to a table inside Hive, we are not copying the data. We're not reorganizing data. We're only storing a little bit of metadata that then the infrastructure knows how to interpret. Okay, that's all. We're not copying data or anything, it's just, we're applying this abstraction on top of the CSV files, okay? Now, about a year and a half ago, we did our first foray into big data. We released at the Dev Summit two, a year and a half ago, a little bit less than that, GIS tools for Hadoop. This was some open source software that ESRI put out there for working with Hadoop. Let's go through it very quickly. First, at the highest level, there's a collection of tools and samples, open source tools as well as samples, that you can use to solve interesting problems. Good examples. Now, inside there, one grouping was a spatial framework for Hadoop. This consisted of two things. First, uh, inside Hive, which remember is that SQL-like abstraction. We're taking files and we're mapping them to tables and we want to do SQL-like things. Well, we have, we extended Hive with a UDF, user-defined functions. What we ended up doing was we created essentially something akin to an OGC spatial type on top of Hive so that you have essentially a, a spatial type that you can utilize with Hive. Now, it's not OGC compliant, but it is very similar to one that would be OGC compliant. In addition to that, it also had some JSON helper utilities for converting between different uh, formats uh, in, in order to load up your geometry and whatnot. Now, 
There's also a collection of geoprocessing tools, essentially Python toolboxes. Now, these GP tools you can use with ArcGIS to copy data to and from Hadoop. No, don't copy 10 billion records from a geo database to Hadoop. No, you're not going to do that. That's silly. But maybe you're going to copy your county's file or your, inter your airport's geography file or the, f the data that you want to filter against. You want to take those 10 billion points in Hadoop that you already have there and you want to apply some geometries or have some smaller geometries that you can then aggregate based upon. Okay, maybe it's counties, census, census tracts, who knows what. But, so there are tools to copy data to Hadoop and tools to copy data, the results of these operations from Hadoop back to a local geodatabase. Um, and there are ways to convert these files that are transmitted in JSON to and from JSON to into tables, as well as a mechanism to actually uh, invoke jobs on Hadoop. Okay? Finally, there's an open source geometry API. Um, this thing can be used outside of Hadoop. We see people that are uninterested in Hadoop they are still taking this geometry API authored in Java. Open source, you can use it for whatever you want. Okay? It's just a geometry library. We leverage it inside GIS tools for Hadoop, but you can do whatever you want to with it. It's all just out there. Now, very recently, it looks like January or July 10th, that was like a week ago, we released um, some significant improvements to GIS tools for Hadoop. Um, basically what we did was we got a little bit smarter and we figured out how to uh, be able to run the spatial queries much faster, particularly the relational operators, such as contains and overlaps. Through some a little bit more aggressive caching and a little bit smarter code on our part, we were able to figure out how to make these queries run three to 20 times faster, okay? So doing a point and polygon aggregation, say you had 175 million points and you're aggregating them into a collection of polygons, that operation uh, on our cluster now takes four minutes. Two weeks ago, it was taking 75 minutes, okay? That's a pretty significant performance increase. In addition, we provided some new, new functions for Hive uh, to essentially create bins and then uh, essentially get bin addresses and then be able to create physical bins, the, the extent of the bins, okay? Um, those, are, those are two important spatial functions that we added in there. Um, the final thing is, oh yes, uh, we must admit that the interns responsible for the previous version have been sacked, okay? We got rid of them. In fact, we were so embarrassed by this whole fiasco that the people that did the sacking got sacked themselves. It's now gone back to corporate and we're thinking about sacking the sackers that sack the sackers. <laughs> anyway, we're trying to do better. Moving forward, okay. That's what we have today. That's what you have access to today. We're now gonna start talking about future stuff. Okay, all kinds of disclaimers. We're not promising anything but this is our best guesses right now, okay? And this is stuff, everything we're gonna show you here actually is running, and Mike is gonna be demoing it live, okay? Against real data. But let me take you through a story, okay? So, remember, no, this is not part of ArcGIS 10. No, there's no commitment to ship this, but yes, this is what we think would be some cool technology right now. Okay? No decisions have been made regarding productization or anything like that. So, you can't go back to your account rep or whoever and say, where is da 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 da? No. We're just showing you R&D right now, okay? Let's start off. What are we looking at right now? We're looking at taxi cab data. We're zoomed into New York City. We're actually zoomed into LaGuardia Airport. Each of those little dots is a taxi cab trip. And it looks like from there, I can't tell whether it's a drop off or a pickup. I'm thinking it's a drop off looking at the patterns around the airport. Each of those individual points is a taxi cab ride in New York City. Now, what's interesting is this data set, we just came across it two or three weeks ago. Open source data set. 
It is every single taxi cab ride that occurred in New York City in 2013. Some dude did a Freedom of Information Act thing, and he went to the hack authority with a hard drive, and they put it all on his hard drive. Then he bit torrented it and made it all available. You can go home and grab it, okay? It's a great data set, 170 million trips for last year. Just one year, 170 million trips. And this is when you start visualizing it. Now, here's the story. Users have huge quantities of very valuable data, but it's hard to deal with. When you're dealing with 170 million things or another order of magnitude or two or three beyond that, it becomes extremely difficult to work with. Okay, this is, these are large, painful data sets. One of the interesting things is anyone that has a real big data problem doesn't want the problem. And anyone that wants to have a big data problem typically doesn't, okay? It's one of those really painful situations organizations can find themselves in. Now, thing is, it's hard to manage. It's difficult to visualize. We'll show you firsthand. And how do you find what's interesting? 170 million taxi cab trips, was anything interesting? What can I learn from that? Where do I start? Now, our perspective right now is that ArcGIS using with Hadoop will allow users to analyze big data, big data sets, to derive smaller, more manageable data sets that contain the valuable information. Essentially, we want to provide infrastructure that will allow you to boil down that huge sea of data into the really interesting little bits that you can do great things with using standard techniques inside ArcGIS. Utilize all the nearly 1,000 geoprocessing functions to do smart things with your data. Okay? Now, what does Hadoop? We talked about that. The nice thing about Hadoop is, and again, it runs on commodity hardware. Um, commodity meaning just garden variety PCs. Load them up with RAM, 16 gigs of RAM, terabyte of hard drive, something like that. The stuff scales, it is fault tolerant. And it is, it's a pretty elegant little system to use. A lot of people have been authoring stuff to make it easier and simpler and whatnot. Now, let's see here. We have we have our 170 million records of New York City taxi cab. It's very dense data. It's just in the seven New York bureau, boroughs, and it is freely available. Each record contains pickup, drop-off location in terms of lat longs, pickup, drop-off date times, the date and time, passenger count, distance traveled, time traveled. There are also other attributes such as um, the fare that was charged, uh, the hack ID, the hack license, all kinds of interesting things. Now, this is kind of what it would look like in a tabular representation. Pick up date time, drop off date time, passenger count, trip time, trip distance, blah, 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 okay? Now, let's pretend that I'm some GIS person. I'm an analyst. Quite frankly, I've never taken a GIS class in my life or a geography class. I'm a computer science guy. All the GIS stuff I have learned is by fixing bugs, okay? That's the only way I learned GIS, GIS stuff. Now, let's say we're trying to find a new shuttle route. We wanna find, say we wanna find a shuttle route between seven and 9 a.m. somewhere in New York. Where would be a good place to put a shuttle bus, okay? That's my question. My boss said, where are we gonna send that shuttle bus between seven and nine? in the morning. And I have to figure out the best place to put it, or a very good place to put it. So what am I going to do? First I'm going to look at, the first question I want to see is, I want to see how many passengers arrive at all the destinations between 7 and 9. Limit my search space between 7 and 9. They're doing an arrival. Now, once I have that, I want to find the best area for a drop off based upon densities and whatnot. Then, based upon having a good drop-off location, I want to find a good starting location, okay? That's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to kind of reverse engineer it. Now, my other caveat is I work for the Panda Bus Company. This is my bus that I'm going to fill up with people to take to the destination place. 
Has anyone in here other than myself seen the Tokyo Panda bus firsthand? Next time you're in Tokyo, look for it. It's a free, free uh, shuttle service in Tokyo. OK. Let's prepare the data. How do I get my data in? How do I get it so I can start using this stuff? Let's say we just go and download the data. What do we do? We're going to go to this location. This is a real location. And we're going to go get all that zipped taxicab data. Then from there, we're going to use the Hadoop command line, use the HDFS command line, and we're going to take all that zipped data and we're going to dump it into Hadoop, okay, into HDFS. Then once we get it onto HDFS, we're going to register it in Hive. Remember, Hive is that table and SQL-like way of interacting with our data. We're going to register it with Hive using a web app called Hue. Here's an example. This is just the Hue uh, web app. It says, create a new table from a file. It says, first thing, name your table and choose the file. So I'm basically giving it a name, and I'm pointing it, the CSV files, to a location uh, inside the system. Then after that, I specify to the system what the uh, delimiter is. In this case, it's a comma. And then finally, I define the columns based upon the information I just gave. It starts tearing it apart and says, first column, what do you want to call it? Oh, object ID. Second column, you know, what do I want to call that? Third column, whatever. Hack license, vendor ID, rate codes, stuff like that. So this is where you do all your mappings to get the things in the hive. Okay? It's through, an, through a web app called Hue. Okay, that's all done. Now, I have this data. I have tabular data, but I want spatial data. I want to spatially enable this data that I have in Hive. So what I need to do is I need to be able to define which, col which columns contain spatial information and what is the spatial reference. This ena enables ArcGIS to work with the data. So here's our Hadoop Tools toolbox inside ArcGIS. We're going to use the Define Spatial Attributes tool. Keep in mind, this is not a real product yet. This is what we're experimenting with. This is what our thinking is at right now. You will not find a Hadoop Tools toolbox in ArcGIS 10.2.2 or 10.3 later this year, okay? Don't go looking for it. It's not there. <laughs> Seriously, it's not there. This is our desktop development machines, okay? Back in the evil laboratory. So. Um, here we are, defining spatial attributes. We point to the input, uh, input table. We define what the geometry field format is. And we map what is, the, what is field 1, which corresponds to x. That's the longitude. Field 2, format of that is the latitude. And then we give the coordinate system and then the extent of the data. Pretty familiar for anyone that ever has used GP inside ArcGIS. OK, done. What that has now done is it, it has taken all that New York City taxicab data that we downloaded and loaded into HDFS, registered with Hive, and now we have gone and added to the Hive metadata to say we now have spatial information that we have knowledge about and it's contained within these columns. It's essentially a spatial table from the ArcGIS perspective. Now, in order to do this analysis, we want to export some local data in a geodatabase and send it down to Hadoop. And in this case, it's some um, uh, New York City uh, census tract information, I believe. So it's the input feature. It's just pointing to a, uh, a uh, file geodatabase called Testing Shapes. And the feature class name is Taxi New York Census. And the output feature is, again, we're just pointing to a connection much like a .sde file, SDE connection, you know, for your enterprise geodatabase connections, we'll have a Hadoop connection. Maybe it's in dread.hadoop. That's just, that's just what we call our connection. We're using a Hadoop suffix rather than a .sde suffix. And then we give it the table name we want to map it to inside HDFS. OK. So then, if you look on the right in the catalog view, I don't know if my mouse, does my mouse show up? Yeah, up there. You see dread.hadoop. That is the connection to my Hadoop, my local Hadoop cluster. And inside it, 
We had the taxi trips, we had the census data, and we also had destination, a table mapping to the destinations. Okay? Now, what if we want to draw it? Blam. That's what the data looks like. That's the data. It took 19 minutes to draw, pull all that data from Hadoop, but those are the 170 million taxi cab records. Hmm. Taxis drive out in the Atlantic Ocean, they go out in Long Island Sound, they're going up the Hudson, and what are they doing in Jersey? Who knows? <laughs> One thing you will realize is with big data, big data has a lot of junk data in it too. This is the data. It's supposed to all be in New York City. Okay? A lot of it's out in the Atlantic. Who knows why? A lot of it's in the river, a lot of it's in the sound. Right. But that's what it really looks like. Now, this data is so dense. Here I've zoomed into Grand Central, Grand Central Station on 42nd Street, New York, right underneath the former Pan Am building, now Grand Central. And I'm looking at a corner of the building. And that extent is what, like 100 meters by, uh, I don't know, 70 meters? You see each of those blue dots? That corresponds to a taxi trip that, that essentially started at that location. Now what's also frightening here is that if you go and you select one of those little dots, there may be 5,000 records at that location. This is frightful. 170 million records, point data, all in New York City. Okay? This is just one year. We're not talking about cell phone. If we were dealing with cell phones, it'd be like three orders of magnitude higher. That's how dense this is. Now, let's figure out how to get uh, the people between seven and nine. Am I going too slow? No. Okay. I don't even have demos working. Oh, okay. Okay. How do we figure out how many passengers arrive at their destination between seven and nine? Up at the top, you see sort of a, a GP model-like representation. We're gonna take the raw data, we're gonna do a selection on it, and select all the records that have a drop-off between seven and nine, and we'll have a new output selected drop-off point data set, okay? So let's use this uh, select tool. Now, what's interesting, <coughs> with this is we're not using the standard ArcGIS select tool. We're using a special select tool that has been authored. It looks like a normal select tool, but it's part of the Hadoop toolbox, okay? It's part of the Hadoop tools. It is a select tool that has a different implementation that will run natively on Hadoop. It's not running on your desktop. It's a job that's running on Hadoop. Okay, so in here, we're, we're putting in our input table, the taxi, taxi trips with the destination geometries, I'm giving it an output name of destination between seven and nine, and then we're giving it one of those hive queries, a SQL expression. We're saying drop off time greater than or equal to seven and drop off time less than or equal to nine. That's pretty simple stuff. And then we have an extent, and it's the same as display in this case. And you plus press go. Okay. Now, here's the same thing, but all the points between 7 and 9 a.m. drop off. It's a little bit different. Now we're down to 30 million points rather than 170 million points. And it looks like in the morning they don't drop off too many people into the East River or anything like that. Okay, kind of sketchy. Must be a lot of gangsters and mobsters in New York. Okay. So that's just visualizing that. Okay, we've cut 170 million down to 30 million through that little select tool in the Hadoop toolbox. Now, based upon that, what's the best location for a drop-off? How do we find, with all this data right here, where do you go? Um, probably in a blue area, but where? Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take those drop-off points that we just uh, selected and we're gonna do various different things. We're gonna look at the frequency. Where are the areas of high density where people are being dropped off? And we're gonna use three different tools. Um, we're gonna use aggregate by polygons. We'll do aggregate by cells and hotspot analysis. 
for hotspot analysis is going to be keyed off of the aggregate, uh, aggregate by cells result. And you can see that up above. Okay? You guys all know how to read GP models. Should all be pretty standard. So, what we want to do is to find the drop off areas. We're going to look at trends by neighborhood. We want to use essentially uh, uh, administrative boundaries. That was, remember in the beginning where I took some of that census data and I said export to Hadoop? That's why. I want to use it. I want to do aggregate by polygons where the polygons are census tracts. Okay? It's pretty much like a spatial join. And this is, it's very useful. So let's, let's just do it. We have the aggregate points by polygons tool in the Hadoop toolbox. Okay? See that? And here's the tool. Input points were the destinations between seven and nine. The aggregating polygons are the census tracts, which fields we want to have summarized in the aggregate. Uh, what's the extent and what our output table is, which is destination seven to nine aggregated by polygon. Okay, this is what the census tracts look like in New York. I was going to make a map of them as a result. This is kind of what it looks like. Now, the interesting thing is um, here, let's just zoom in a little bit more. We're looking at the total passenger counts. If you read, it means we have seen over 870,000 people being dropped off in that census tract between seven and nine over the course of the year. Green means we see less than 68,000 people being dropped off at that census tract across the year. Now, the big red, red polygon diagonal, that's just Central Park, okay? Now, the other ones, what's the big yellow one on the south, southeast? Yeah, it's JFK Airport. The orange one in the middle, LaGuardia, okay. So we're seeing a lot of interest in midtown Manhattan, a lot of stuff at the airports. No surprise. Now, what's nice to know is to draw all this, it was less than one second. Just like bang, done. One of the nice things about using aggregates. Now, we can also aggregate uh, points by cells to summarize the information. What we're doing here is we're essentially able to specify a grid or a, a tessellation of cells, and then we can start counting information, counting all the little taxi trips that fall in that cell. And in that red thing right there, we can see, oh, there's only one taxi trip. Whereas up here in the northeastern corner, there's a lot of taxi trips in that. But if you then, with this, this cell right here, if we then clicked on and identify on that cell, we would see Okay, there's only one record in there, right there. And we can see how many trips there were. Okay, there was one trip. Yeah, okay, that's right. And apparently it was a 391 minute long trip. And the average trip time is not too unsurprisingly also 391 minutes. Okay, or seconds, maybe it's seconds. Actually, it's seconds, that'd be a long trip. Um, and so you get all the summary information. Now. What's interesting to note, okay, here we're using the tool, aggregate points by cells. In here, we point the, the destination between seven and nine data set on Hadoop, on HDFS. See, again, through dread.hadoop. We want to get passenger count, trip time in seconds, and trip distance. The output table is going to be aggregated by cell. Okay, we do all the spatial reference stuff, and we do aggregated cell size. In this case, it's 0 .0005, which is in degrees, uh, 50, me I don't know, 50 something or others, 50 meters, something like that. Doesn't really matter too much. Now, yeah, I think it's about 50 meters. Now, here's the output of that when we're just looking at the visualization of distance traveled. Now, on the left, it's also interesting to note, um, this is the draw times. So when you have aggregates, although the first aggregate that we're looking at right now, when the cell size of 0 .0005, which is about a 50, 50 meter uh, grid, takes five seconds to draw that to the screen. If you had all the hours, the aggregate for all the hours, not just those 30 million, it's still about the same because you have the same aggregate polygons that are, or cells that are going back. 
No surprise there. However, if we go and increase or make the cell size smaller down to like a five meter cell, it's gonna take longer, okay? It's taking an order of magnitude more time because our cell size is an order of magnitude smaller, okay? No big surprise there. We look at distance traveled, okay, what do we see? Oh, Midtown Manhattan on Manhattan, people don't go very far. Wow, if you're out here in Brooklyn, you're out in Coney Island, you're starting to see some longer trips, okay? Not too surprising. By the airport, a little bit longer trips as well. The further out you are from New York City, the longer the trips are, okay? Now, we can also look at passenger counts, okay? How many passengers we're seeing? So let's zoom in. We, okay, so you see a um, number of passengers being picked up. In this area, midtown Manhattan, between, say, Grand Central and uh, going up the east side through uh, Rockefeller Center, that's a real hot spot. A lot of activity in cabs there, not too surprising. Um, now, let's zoom into an area that's interesting. This is LaGuardia. Okay, here we have our aggregate data. We've just zoomed in a little bit. And we can see those little hot areas, and these are near the, the, the two main terminals at LaGuardia, where we're seeing total passengers in that one cell that have been transported as being more than 15,000 people across the course of the year. These are hot, very hot little areas right near the airport. These are the drop, these are the, these are the areas where you're dropping off people at the two terminals, okay? Now, Okay, we have all that. But how do we really figure out what's important? We've just drawn some pretty pictures and we have some renderers. Who knows why those, those breaks were set up, those class breaks were set. And we can make anything look important just, just based upon how we set up the class break renderers. But how do we find statistically valid answers? How am I not just looking at a pretty picture or a map that's lying to me, but I'm actually looking at something that's statistically valid, statistically significant, okay? If I'm a decision maker, I don't wanna just look at a pretty picture and say, yeah, that looks, that looks right. No, I want to look at something that has statistically significant results that's pointing to me and saying, with 99% certainty, I know something is exceeding this threshold in this area. It's not just, oh, it could have been by chance. No, I need to really know. So, what we also have is uh, to find the most interesting areas, we're gonna use some hotspot analysis, okay? Hotspot analysis tool, that's a tool that we already have in our, um, uh, in our statistical uh, toolbox inside ArcGIS, inside geoprocessing, but we've actually gone and created a native implementation that runs on top of HDFS. So let's go and look at that. Let's look at our hotspot clusters. See the hot spots and the, and the cold spots. And we're gonna use our spatial bend information to feed the hotspot analysis. So here we pull up the hotspot analysis tool. We take our aggregated cells collection. Remember, between seven and nine, the aggregate based upon cells. Then we're gonna do a hotspot analysis based upon the passenger count. We want to sum it all together. We want to find the hotspots for where people are being dropped off. And that's going to be our output table name. And we hit OK Go. This is the result when you do that in map space, in ArcMap. Now, what's interesting is we see the rendering here, the red stuff, is with 99% confidence, we have a hotspot, okay? So we see some stuff there, of course, in Manhattan. We also see LaGuardia, and we see some stuff down there at JFK. And it's very fast to draw these results, three to four seconds. Okay? Now, what if we go and we, we essentially mask it? We, put, we look at the Z scores, where a Z is essentially a standard deviation, and we're gonna draw where the Z score on this analysis when it's three or less, three standard deviations or less, we're gonna put a blue cell in there. Otherwise, we're gonna let the stuff that we're masking shine through. So now we know these areas where you can see the color of the green, the yellow, and the red, those are areas where the Z-score is three or greater, meaning three or more standard deviations. We truly know that is a very good hotspot. And we're gonna look at the, the total passenger count here. Zooming in a little further, okay. The blue is just as a mask, anything with a Z-score less than three. 
we're not going to pay attention to. We want to be really sure of what we're doing. We zoom into LaGuardia, and actually, yeah, those terminals are important. They are statistically significant at, at a 99% threshold. Okay? Now, we've decided LaGuardia is a good time to drop, good place to drop people off. Tell me something I don't know, Eric, you're all saying. Okay, but we're, we're just going through a workflow. Where do I want to pick people up? Okay, so what we're going to do in order to do that is we're going to export the data back into ArcGIS, all these taxi cab records that are near LaGuardia. We're going to create an XY event layer so that we can visualize the origin locations. And then we're going to use a point density function on them, a part of our GP toolbox, our standard GP toolbox that, in fact, you do have with 10.2.2. Okay? Very simple. So what we're going to do, zoom into LaGuardia, import the drop-off locations using this tool, and then perform local analysis. Local analysis on my local data on my geodatabase, not inside Hadoop. Okay? So here, here's the area again. Let's go and do import from Hadoop to a local geodatabase. So again, you look right here, we're going to take all the destination trips, all the trips that are in this area that have the destination, we're going to clip to the display, and then we're going to output it to a local file geodatabase, okay, called Trip Destination 7 to 9 LaGuardia. Here we're back in map, and these are all the points that came across when we pulled it back into a local geodatabase. Okay, we don't have the 170 million things, we have the small collection. Then, we're going to do a make XY event layer based upon the pickup, longitude, latitude. Why are we doing that? Because remember, it had pickup, longitude, latitude, destination, latitude, longitude. We took the destination and had that transformed into our shape. We can't have two shapes, so we're going to take the origin longitude, latitude, and make an XY event layer out of them. Okay, nice parlor trick. And here's what happens. Here we have our, our, our XY event layer. That's where all the people going to LaGuardia started from. And it really sucks being the people that are JFK having to go to LaGuardia. How many of you have done that before? It's the worst. <laughs> Taking a cab from one airport to another. Okay. So anyway, now it's in local geodatabase, and we know where these things had their, as their origin. So let's just use one of our standard tools, point density. And run point density. And here's the result. Okay, this is what it looks like, just using standard ArcGIS stuff. So then we go, okay, now we're starting to see some interesting locations to use as origins. Now, the keen observer will note, wow, this one looks a little odd. What the heck is that? You know, you expect these things in Midtown, all these. What is that one? That one looks kind of interesting. So, let's go use that one. Let's explore that one a little bit. Oh, oh yeah, that's where all the ships come in. It's sort of the, that port terminal for all the cruise ships that come in to New York City. So, very interesting. That's what we're going to use as our pickup location for the New York City Panda Bus. We're going to go from the port to LaGuardia between 7 and 9 in the morning, okay? That's just, it's very simplified here what I did, but I hope you're getting a little bit of the picture of how you're able to use standard metaphors, comfortable ways that you already know how to work with ArcGIS, and oh, instead of working with SDE or a file geodatabase, or, you know, not SDE, but an enterprise geodatabase, Oracle, SQL Server, Postgres, whatever, or a file geodatabase, oh, it just happens to be Hadoop. Oh, cool. And I'll just use regular tools. And maybe I don't need to know how to write a MapReduce job. You didn't see me do anything with MapReduce here. I used Hive. I did a SQL query. And that was just GP tools. And when I boiled it down, I then was able to bring it into ArcGIS and use all the other thousand tools that I have at my disposal. We're trying to make this stuff easy. As much fun as it, as it is to be a MapReduce, you know, big data geek, we want it so that everyone can do this stuff, okay? 
using familiar workflows, familiar tools, familiar user experiences. We don't want you to have to go take crazy new training, learn, buy a whole bunch of books, and learn these obs you know, obscure things on how to deal with HDFS or, or Hadoop or you know, MapReduce, anything like No, we just want to make it easy for you, okay? So, summary, yeah, there's a lot of taxis, you know, a lot of them in Manhattan, we're at LaGuardia, we're going for the, for the Manhattan Cruise Terminal, okay? And without this stuff that we've been working on, that would have been next to impossible to figure out with desktop. Okay. Now, this is just showing very quickly oh, the various tools that we used, all the highlighted ones on the right pane in the toolbox uh, area. Oh, sorry, darn it. Those are the ones we used, and here's what they were doing and what they were producing, okay. There's additional tools in here that we did not go over, building indexes, doing kernel density functions, or similarity searches. This is what they would be used for. Um, working with ArcGIS and big data, how much time do we have? Plenty, keep going. Oh, you want me to? You sure? No, I can, I can shut it down now. Do you guys want to hear him talk, or do you want to see demos? Talk, talk, <laughs> talk. More PowerPoint, more PowerPoint. All right. Anyway, we'll just go through these pretty quickly. And these are some of the workflows and whatnot that you can use. <laughs> okay. I did it for you. Okay. No, but very seriously, um, yeah. You saw all these. This is just summary information. It's preaching to the choir. Okay. Yeah, so what? One thing to remember about Hadoop in HDFS, you can't edit the data. Okay. You can't go in and edit one record in Hadoop. No. Hadoop only allows you to read data or append data. It's a big batch system. You're not going to go in there and select one thing and change it. No. You can't do that with Hadoop. Okay? Um, also, remember, we, you know, some of the tools, um, we, were, we were using special tools intended just for Hadoop with a lot of that. You're not using the standard things that you find on our tools toolbars right now inside ArcGIS. We were using those special you know, Hadoop tools in that Hadoop toolbox, okay? So, we're going to see some sweet mousing around. Yeah. Okay, how many of you were in our session yesterday? Okay, you'll be happy to know that projection was the reason why what those polygons did not show. Yeah, yesterday was a big epic failure. None of the huge, demos worked. Huge failure. Part of them worked. I blame ArcMap. That's always a good move for your career. <laughs> <laughs> These are being recorded, young Jedi. <laughs> what an epic failure. <laughs> I, but God. Would you like a piece are, of gum? Are you done? Gum, anyone? Gum, 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 gum. I've always been told you should put as much gum in your mouth before you do a presentation or smoke a cigarette. Uh, so I can't smoke in here, so we okay. chose gum. Okay. Can I continue? Would you like a piece of gum? So this is the FAA data. This is flight points in the U.S., and it's aggregated into bins, and that's that aggregate points by cells GP tool. And uh, it's, it's, some, it's uh, symbolized based on the count of points that were in each cell. So we're just going to mess around here. So I'll zoom in here. And what I'm going to show you is the points overlaid on top of the cells. So you kind of get an idea of what's going on. Now it's important to note, these are, all of these tables are in Hadoop. They're just rendering directly from Hadoop. The FAA data set is 17 million points, but we can render it pretty quickly here. And it's rendering bottom left to top right because we have it sorted on, with an index. And so that's how the index orders the data. Okay, that's cool. But we want to get to the taxi data. So I'll go to New York. So here on the side, you can see this is our data source, and my mouse is moving by itself. Okay, data source there on the right. You can see all of our tables. These were mapped from Hive. Um, they all have spatial data. You can see one of them, the counties, has polygons, but the rest of them mostly points. Okay. 
So the first thing, one of the things that Eric showed is you can define your spatial attributes on top of these hive tables. I already have them defined, but I'm going to show you kind of how it works. So I can just drag my FAA data set over here. I pick the field format, and that's uh, that could be GeoJSON, the well-known text. For this case, it's XY fields. It's actually two different fields, longitude, latitude. Okay. So we pick the longitude, we pick the latitude. Okay, that's great. Coordinate system and the extent. Now, there's another one in here, IP address. And this one is cool because it's actually a plugin. We have an extensibility model that we're gonna, we, we hope to have an extensibility model. And this IP address thing, I just took a GeoLite IP address mapping thing and I can take server log files and on the fly, I can render them in ArcGIS but their IP addresses in the back end. And it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, and actually it's very fascinating. We went and grabbed the ArcGIS online server logs with all the IP addresses and the areas that they were querying, the, the, the base maps. And we were all able to go all over the world and figure out who and what location is looking at what. We saw what was going on in North Korea and what they like to mouse around uh, looking at. It's, it's actually pretty interesting. But the key bit there, all, all joking aside, is that there is going to be an extent, there, there will, there should be an extensibility mechanism that will then take, allow you to take data that's kind of spatial, kind of not, maybe data that can be geolocated. And something as bizarre, not just an address, but an IP address, and then hit a server that'll give you back an XY. That's pretty cool. That's part of this. So you can imagine on the fly geocoding. Maybe all of your addresses are actual street addresses. You could geocode it on the fly, render it. Might take a while, but you could do something like that. Okay, so that's cool. So here I am in New York. I'm just gonna drag the entire taxi trip data set onto the screen. And we're rendering at about 200,000 records a second. That's not bad, but it still takes a long time because there's a lot going on. You can see it's stuck here in uh, Manhattan because there's just a lot of stuff. Yeah, in that little corner there, you can see yep. a little activity down at, down the financial district. There's so much data, and that's 200,000 records per second. This is dense data. Okay, so then zoom into Manhattan. Bring that back up. There you go. You can just see it going really slow down there because just millions of points stacked on top of each other. So that's not ideal. So we'll go back out to New York and we'll do a low resolution bin. And you can see this is summarized by the count of taxi trips here. Now, we could take this and we could symbolize on, let's do average trip time, average trip distance, that one works. Okay, that's a bit chaotic, but you can see some bit of pattern here in the airports, right here and then right here. The data is pretty noisy in general. So we'll take a lower resolution one. This was created at a smaller bin. Lower. Higher resolution. Higher resolution. Yes. That whole geography thing. I don't know anything Small about scale, it. big, th <laughs> big, small, I don't know. So you can see this one takes a little longer to render. Not too long, it's not too bad, and that's fine. But it, it, it paints a more compelling picture of what's going on there. So we can zoom back into Manhattan. You can see it rendering in sort of a zigzag area, and that's a, that's a, a result of how the data is stored in Hadoop. It's actually across multiple files, and so it renders them interest, in interesting patterns. Yeah, that's, that's one key thing. Remember we were talking about how data files get distributed across your cluster. We're hitting a cluster of about 20 different nodes, 20 different CPUs back in Redlands. And you can see that even this aggregated data has been spread across different nodes. It's not all stored in one location. It can be distributed all around, okay? Correct. So let's go to JFK. Decent resolution, you can kind of see the terminals, but it's, it's still not very, you can't see really what's going on. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna create a smaller bin level. 
and we're going to use this tool, aggregate points by cells. Okay. Create a finer grain bin, smaller bins, right? So we can see more. So we can just drag our table over. We can select a couple of attributes to summarize on, and then we just give it an output table. And I only want to aggregate and keep the cells that are within this extent. So I'm going to say same as display as the data extent. And then finally, our cell size is going to be 0 0.00005. So that's one order of magnitude greater than the one we have right now on the screen. It's like a five meter cell size. So this is interesting. We run this GP tool, and this one is actually executing in Hadoop. And what you'll start to see is messages coming from Hadoop involving MapReduce. MapReduce is happening in the background. And the first thing is it, it shows at 0%. It stays at 0% for a while because a lot of the initial uh, cost of Hadoop is you have to spin up a bunch of jobs on all the machines. So it starts out slow, and then it kind of jumps up faster. So it should go, it should go up to 20% and then 50-ish, and it speeds up quite a lot. And then you can see the reduce, and the reduce is where we've done our mapping, and now we're copying the data over to the machines where it's going to be reduced on. And you can see it says copy right there. This whole thing usually takes about two minutes to go through all 175 million points, consistently two minutes regardless of your output data size. So if your output was the same size as the input, still the same amount. If you return one feature, still the same amount, because it has to crunch through the entire data set. Yeah, that's, that's one of the interesting things, is we are, we are going through the entire data set across those 20, the 20-node 20 cluster. So it will be essentially a constant time type of operation. I lied, it was one minute, 15 seconds. That's pretty good. Yeah, not bad. OK, so you can see lower resolution. Now what we want to do is symbolize. We're going to symbolize on the count of passenger count. And that sounds redundant, but that's actually a count of the passenger count records that were not empty. And so for statistics, you need that. Why don't so you use a rainbow that. ramp? Rainbow? Yeah. Which is completely, which one do you want, blue to red? I don't know, down a little bit, up a little bit, towards the top, six from down. That one? No. Down, this down, one? down. <laughs> like that one. That one's a good one. Okay, blue to red. Yeah, rainbow. Yeah, just what I said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. That's a rainbow, right? Yeah. And then the last thing, you always have to do this for these types of small cells, is you need to get rid of the outline, because otherwise, yeah, terrible. Do you want to set a high value? Set the high value, or is it a, it's good? It's mm. good because oh, that's it's right. a small smaller cell. area. Okay. That's why I did yeah. that. See, I was thinking mm. when I started. Mm. Smarty. I have to deal with this every day. <laughs> so. Now this is pick up or drop off? This is pick up. Why don't you talk about There's some interesting stuff going on there. I was going to talk to it. Good. Thank you. We'll see how insightful you see. can be. <laughs> So you can see all the terminals, they have the red spots. And it's actually an interesting Gaussian pattern around it because of the uh, inaccuracy of GPS. There's all kinds of uh, noise around it. So one of the things we want to do is we probably want to take out all of these low records because they're probably not valid. So we'll just. Again, that's one of the, big th one of the things with big data is you get a lot of junk in it. There's a lot of junk when you're working with hundreds of millions of things, even, you know, maybe a small fraction, but it sure shows up. So that looks a little better, a little less noisy. So the interesting thing about this is this is every point where the taxi drivers flick the switch on their, uh, their meter. And so they don't always flick the switch where you would think they would. You can see here, right in the middle here, on these on-ramps, it's an interesting place. They all, for some reason, they just flip the switch right here. That's yeah. not when you sit down, necessarily. They may drive a little bit. Yeah. Like, like if you look on the west side there, there's a fork in the road. 
to go down to Van Wyck to head back into Manhattan to the west, or go up towards LaGuardia to the north. So it's like that little fork in the road is a visual cue to them to turn on the meter. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I would start it right away, but I don't know. So this is just a cool data set to, to look, to mess around with. You find out all kinds of interesting things. You look at the airports, you look at where they're turning on their, their things. And you can also do the same thing with the destinations. So that's pretty cool. You can also start looking for fraud detection. There are some data points out there where why are they turning off on their meter there? We need to get some higher resolution imagery to see is there a taxi stand out in the middle of nowhere and when they just start rolling the cab forward, do they turn on the meter and when you or some poor slob getting in at JFK loading all your bags and kids and whatnot, the meter's already been going for a little while. You know, we're starting to look at some of that. It's, I think some of that's going on too. You can start harvesting and figuring that stuff out with these techniques. It's quite fascinating. All that CSI stuff, yeah? CSI, right? yeah. We should probably stay away from that. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna demonstrate the select tool. So this is where you have, instead of aggregating, you actually wanna pull out individual features. You wanna bring back a smaller data set. So we'll open up our select tool, bring in our taxi trips, give an output, and then here, because we have this in Hive, I can just use SQL Builder, and I can say, I want to take everything where passenger count is greater than six. Yeah, that's a pretty cool query builder against Hadoop. That's kind of nice. I don't want an extent. And this is running a Hive query, and this is actually split up into multiple MapReduce jobs. It should take about two minutes. You can see here, you can actually see the, the query that we generated. And Passenger just, count greater than six? <laughs> I've done it. We get back maybe six features. <laughs> very, very big minivans. Mm. Figure out which cabs are carrying people in the trunk. So you can see a somewhat interesting metric here on the right. This is cumulative CPU time. This is the amount of time spent for all machines in that task. And so it may take you 10 seconds, but it might show that it took the computers three days if you had enough computers. Okay, so it finished the first MapReduce job. It says it takes seven minutes cumulative. Didn't take us that long. But it would have if we only had one machine. It would have taken us about seven minutes. And done. OK. This is all the points that had passenger count greater than six. There's not really any rhyme or reason to it, but it's pretty interesting. And it kind of shows what you can do, what sorts of things you can do, what questions you can ask. You could ask for a trip distance greater than 10 miles, right? Just have the answers come back really quickly. You could also, because this data does have essentially the hack license in it, you can start seeing, oh, for a given cabbie, which cabbie is making the most money during the year? This all has the trip, trip cost as well. Um, it has distance driven information. It has time driven, time of trip in seconds. So you can start having a lot of fun with this data to see which cabbie is getting the most money per, per unit distance. You can find out which cab, you know, just all kinds of interesting questions a s suspicious person would ask. Where's that website where they have all that? Here's the website. Chris Wong. Entrepreneuring fellow. Trip data is about 11 gigabytes. And that's zipped, uncompressed. I don't actually know, but it's a lot. It's rather large. This is the one with the GPS points, the trip data. And then the fare data is the one that has, uh, for each trip, it has the how much it costs and things like that. So I think we're almost out of time. We have five minutes left. Oh, okay. Do you want to keep talking? Yeah, sure. Why not? Why don't you entertain him while I pull up some humorous stuff? Or we could have questions. Oh. 
<laughs> what fun is that? <laughs> okay, yeah, why don't we do that? That's probably a better idea. Forgot about that question stuff. Questions. Okay, um, so that, that shows you all the stuff that we put together in that slide deck that I went through. The stuff is real. That wasn't a bunch of mock-up-y stuff. You saw, you saw Mike up here running a number of those uh, GP tools and whatnot on real data and mousing around in real time. And okay. nothing crashed. Nothing crashed. Congratulations. Next you know it. Gum for you. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's, have a, let's have some questions. Whole new data set. Yep. Good question. When I did that query, that Hive query, it's creating a new data set. You know, these Hadoop clusters, you're you're gonna you're gonna load them up with uh, hard drive space. You know, in our cluster, we have 20 nodes. Actually, it's kind of funny. This is one thing to note: um, you don't have to go buy very high-end server racks and all that kind of stuff. Back in, back in Redlands, we uh, decided earlier this year that we wanted to have a Hadoop cluster with about 20 nodes in it. We went and we're talking to the financial people, and to get 20 nodes of rack stuff, you know, you're talking $80,000, $100,000 for a 20-node system in a big fancy rack that has pretty colors and stuff. We tried a different approach where we asked them for flow-down machines. Flow-down machines in, in ESRI parlance are the six-year-old PCs that no one wants that goes to a warehouse that's then going to go into a, to a wood chipper somewhere or something like that. These are machines that no one wanted. Not even the admins. They didn't want them. They were so crummy. So we took these machines. We took 20 of them, and we loaded up each machine with 16 gig of RAM and put, put a gig or a terabyte of fast drive space on them. So to do 20 machines like that, it cost about $3,000, the cost of one node of a new machine. So we have this, this ghetto cluster. It's called the Dread Cluster from Judge Dread, And it's a collection of 20 crud, six, seven-year-old machines. You know, maybe they're quad core, but they're still three gigahertz, but we up the RAM, up the hard drive space. They are very productive machines. So now we're trying to put forward a proposal where every single junk machine in ESRI comes to our team and we will take them all, okay? But you can build up pretty cool clusters out of stuff nobody wants. That whole line about using commodity hardware is absolutely correct, okay? Try it out at home. You know, get one of these uh, Hadoop distributions from Hortonworks or Cloudera, load it up on some ghetto machines, and you can start doing some of this stuff. It's actually quite fun and shocking. You will amaze your friends. Other questions? Yeah. How does my cluster operate under load? I mean, multiple users acting at the same time trying to get it to do multiple things. How does it have to be It depends. That's configurable by the administrator. There's all types of different scheduling methods, priority to different users, priority to different types of jobs. Um, what we're doing. For, for most of the rendering, we don't use MapReduce, so there's no priority on that. That will just run, and if it's slow, it's slow. But for MapReduce jobs, you may actually have to wait for people to, to be done with the job. So, But there is yeah. an infrastructure that's been developed as part of this Hadoop you know, ecosystem for managing these things. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that Yahoo and Facebook and all those are contributing to, and they're making sure that they have these things will work in that type of an environment. They also have 10,000 machines versus our 20. So. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you use high ODBC or JDBC? Neither. We, have, we don't use, the question is, do we use Hive uh, ODBC or JDBC? No, we don't use either of those. We, um, we have a service, well, right now, this is all development, but right now we just have a service running inside Hadoop that connects directly to HDFS. And part of the reason is, is that the index that we have that we're developing does not connect to Hive. It's, you can't run a Hive query with the contains and expect the index to work. So that's the reason we don't use that. So what do you want to use? The space or? No, that's just files in HDFS. CSV files. We we have HBase, but we don't 
we don't have anything for it yet. That's one of the things, though, that we are looking at is NoSQL databases in general. Some of the column stores like, uh, like HBase and Accumulo, there's a lot of interest in the community. We're looking at those. You know, right now we can connect to things such as HANA and Teradata and whatnot. Well, why can't we connect to something like HBase or Accumulo or things of that nature? There's a lot of interest out there in that. Yeah? What? We're run a Windows Server. No, these are Linux boxes. So it could be hind. Do you want to do that or should I? I, I can do it. Oh, yeah. H Hadoop only runs in Linux. That's all it works on. CentOS, Ubuntu, most of the, the common distributions. You can use Windows for development, and it kind of works, but it's really kind of finicky. But but Linux. Another thing you can do. You go, hey, how, how, you showed a lot of uh, ArcGIS desktop, showed the Sadoop stuff. Where's server? Where's the platform? Oh, well, wait a minute. We have a way to connect to it. We have a database connection. I think that'll work through a feature service. It's just another connection. ArcMap's treating it like a connection. Feature services will treat it like a connection. Oh, we had GP. There's the GP service thing. Yeah, that's right. You could invoke these Hadoop jobs through a GP service as well, okay? There are things that you can do to leverage also ArcGIS server if you want that to be the forward-facing thing for your enterprise where people are not directly connecting necessarily through desktop to the Hadoop cluster. They may be connecting to your ArcGIS server instance, okay? You can also do that. That's another thing we're looking at. We're trying to figure all this stuff out. We got the technical details. Now we got to make it nice and friendly. Any other questions? How much of the spatial statistics tools are you going to develop? Spatial statistics tools? It's, uh, it's sort of on a priority basis, but we that's an area that we will continue to actively grow. Mark, do you want to talk to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, immediately, you want to take the hotspot. Do you want to come up here and... sort of up to date with space and time. So a lot of the stuff with the cube, and we have a lot of that already programmed. Um, I think the first release, we weren't going to do space time hotspots, but we have a lot of that already in there. And we could actually, those aggregate tables are multidimensional, so you can actually look at those aggregates over time and then do space time hotspot. Um, but we're sort of figuring out what happens when you have missing data and how to sort of extrapolate between locations. And then we also want to um, spend time doing uh, identifying outliers, um, s uh, significant outliers, and then also like k-means clustering, that sort of stuff. Nice answer. How long before you guys get it? TBD. Talk we to, don't know. Talk to Jack. Talk to Jack. Talk to your account. Just talk to people. If you're interested in this stuff, start talking Definitely to people. We, we're showing you prototypes. But we, that's, that hasn't been figured out. It's not part of 10.3. Okay? But we showed you a lot of feature functionality, a lot of technology, and we tried to present to you also workflows where you could see how all these things can swirl together and doing something meaningful. So if you have more questions, just come by the big data... Uh, stand over by the GeoData island, yeah, yeah. and you can talk directly to me. I'll be there. As well as other members of the team, yep. Okay. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.